Cool. All right. Well, let's start. And I'm going to just take a few minutes just to run through the, you know, little intro. I'm um, just welcome everybody to tonight's chat. Um, my name is Jessica McCready. I'm a, a master's rower at the North Bay Rowing Club, and I'm going to be hosting this evening. Our chat is going to be with Dana Riggs. She's a CEO and founder and principal biologist of Soul Ecology, and she's an MBRC member as well. And in a few minutes, we'll begin our talk on the fish and wildlife of the Petaluma River. Um, just before we get to the presentation, just a brief comment about these chats and the upcoming schedule, and I'll keep it, try to keep it even briefer than usual. I did post the three upcoming chats on the chat, Zoom chat, so I actually um, won't go through the details of that just to um, have a little bit more time with Dana. Um, the venues, just in general, the Petaluma Riverside Chats venues are here to enhance attendees' knowledge of all aspects of rowing, and as well as talks and presentations that raise our awareness of our beloved local Petaluma River and the goings on of the greater Petaluma River community. Um, the recordings are on the Petaluma River Side Chat YouTube channel, and you'll see that link in the Zoom chat as well. And um, so just a quick reminder, if you don't wanna be on the video, just turn your video off. Um, dates and times of the upcoming chats are also listed on the about page of that YouTube channel. Um, Let's see, what else? Uh, we're a small group, but I'm just curious. Uh, it's sort of maybe a little goofy, but if you feel like it, share um, any outdoor environmental, in, environment, outdoor environment or activity that sustains you lately, just to share with folks here if there's something. And of course, everybody, I'm sure rowing is potentially part of that menu, but if there's anything else you might want to share just to give other people ideas about how they can potentially inspire themselves through this COVID world we're living in. Um, through the chat, I mean, excuse me, through this evening, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to, um, I don't know, Dana, I mean, it's a really small group. If you want, people can just unmute themselves or raise their hand, however, you, whatever you'd like to do. Um, um, but anyway, you can make your questions, put your questions in the Zoom chat. And then we'll also definitely have a following Q&A after um, Dana's presentation. And so I'm going to just leave it up to people to look at those, uh, the scheduled chats in the Zoom chat and go on to the introduction. Our tonight's guest is with Dana Riggs. She's been a member of the North Bay Rowing Club for the past 10 years. She has more than 20 years of environmental consulting experience in California, assisting landowners and developers with their permitting and compliance needs. She form formally, formally, she was a principal and director at WRA and head of their wildlife and fisheries department for over six years. In 2017, she launched her own firm, Soul Ecology Inc., specializing in project management, freshwater and coastal ecology, wildlife biology, and environmental policy. Uh, there she directs a broad range of biological studies from planning level to post-construction, including biological assessments, special status species surveys, avian nesting bird surveys, bat roost surveys, frog and salamander assessments and surveys, corridor studies, and habitat management and restoration planning, regulatory permitting, environmental training, biological compliance, <laughs> conservation easement planning, and expertise witness services. This is all just to say we're in good hands tonight. Really happy um, Dana's joining us to share a deeper understanding of the ecology of the Pelham River, its associated habitats, and the rare and endangered species we may encounter on it. And uh, if time permits, she said she'll talk briefly about the small ways we can do our part to help preserve this important ecosystem and our beloved local watershed. So welcome, Dana. Thank you. Thanks Sorry, coming. I didn't mean to give you the laundry list. <laughs> I, I'm all good with laundry lists. I... <laughs> yeah. Well, um, great. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I actually, I can't see the chat with the with my screen share, so um, I'll keep track of it. Yeah. If you would just signal me if somebody has a pressing question or clarification, I know there probably is some bird nerds on the. Call and, and I welcome any comments if you see a, a, a something that you need clarification on. So, okay, okay. Um, great. Well, uh, oh, how do I make this go? <laughs> there we go. 
but you already heard about me. So um, <laughs> <laughs> there you are. This is me on a, on a cold survey morning. Um, it, that's actually Schollenberger Park. So I'll be talking about some of the species that we've been surveying for out there in the cold. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the, I'm going to just briefly talk about the natural history and ecology of the Petaluma River, what that means and um, why it's so special and valuable to us, um, besides being a place that we love to row. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about protective fish and wildlife species, what we mean by protection, what protections are already afforded these animals, um, and, then, and then talk about the species that you may encounter on the river, including um, highlighting those rare species that are there and um, present and you can see pretty much anytime you go out there, just more or less. Um, how to approach and view wildlife, if that's your goal um, to, when you're out there, um, and then um, small ways that we can make a difference. Um, so natural history um, and ecology, natural history, just so everybody's clear on what that means, natural history is the, the scientific study of plants and animals. So. Um, just like regular history, but <laughs> ecology is the branch of biology that deals with the relationships of organisms to one another and their physical surroundings. So uh, I'm a biologist, but I'm really, ecology is my love um, because it's really looking at the interactions between humans, wildlife, wildlife and their habitat, wildlife and other wildlife. Um, the types of ecology that there are, or there's landscape ecology, Population ecology and behavioral ecology are the two, three main types of ecology that, that we study. Um, and why is ecology so important? It, it's, it's really the use of those, that scientific study to uh, inform policymakers and develop safe land, land management practices that protect critical resources. So that it's this added element of understanding the interactions between the environment and the animals that help us to really determine what those practices are or are needed. Um, the Petaluma River is the largest remaining tidal brackish marsh in California. And so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the brackish marsh, what a tidal brackish marsh, marsh is, if I can actually pronounce it, um, <laughs> marsh. <laughs> it's 19 miles long. You can see in this photo, a lot of this um, on the left side of the river, um, um, that's looking, I think that's looking west, it, uh, I think that's looking east. That's what tidal brackish marsh looks like. And the Petaluma River is a unique ecosystem because it incorporates that brackish marsh along with freshwater marsh, along with riverine and upland habitats. So we really have a, um, a, a lot of diverse habitats um, that are to get, you know, continuous and together, um, allowing for species that could not co-occur otherwise. Um, and then because of these linkages, this provides habitat for all stages of life, breeding, foraging, and dispersal. Um, and as a result, it supports a number of endangered and threatened species. So uh, coastal saltwater, saltwater marsh, brackish marsh, what is it? Um, for those of you that have been on the Petaluma River, you've certainly um, rode or paddled past it. Um, these are, um, it's a community of plants that are adapted to saline conditions, also known as halophytes. Um, and they're very tolerant of um, soils that have very low oxygen content and very high soil saturation. So you can see in these photographs, these, these plants um, are very, they're very fleshy. And that's because they'll store the water inside their vascular system, their vascular plants. Um, and so they're very distinctive in the way that they look. Um, um, they are um, characteristic vascular plants include cord grass. That's the photo on the, I'm going to go upper left. I'm going to go clockwise upper left. That's cord grass. Um, that, that really fleshy one is the pickleweed, which I'm going to talk about. Those of you that are familiar with pickleweed and that very rare animal that lives in the pickleweed, um, which is the salt marsh harvest mouse. I'm the bottom right, that's salt grass, and we have that kind of everywhere. And on the bottom left is gum plant, that's Grindelia. And a lot of people look at that and go, oh, that looks like a weed, but it's actually, um, it's actually a, a salt marsh plant that's native. There's also alkali heath, bulrush, and a few others. Um, 
one of the things about the coastal brackish marsh that's unique also is that there's these different gradients that it occurs in. So it occurs, there's in salt, salt marsh communities, you have the mud flat, which is mud flat at low tide and, and open water at higher tides, emergent vegetation, emergent marsh, transitional marsh, and high marsh. So emergent marsh, as you can imagine, is often inundated during tide, tidal events, um, but may be completely exposed at low tide. Transitional marsh is, it's a transition, right? So, and then high, uh, high marsh, uh, which isn't normally inundated. So birds and other species and their behaviors and their life cycles are dependent upon these gradients and often their foraging and nesting in where they are within the marsh is based on that tidal action. Um, and tidal habitats are especially important foraging habitat for species because of the ever-changing availability of nutrients. So uh, brought in each tide, you have new nutrients coming in to the system. So that's really supporting these animals that are dependent on this habitat. Protected species. Um, so this is just a, <laughs> this is a snapshot of all the um, regulations that are in place to help protect these animals that are very um, special on this unique habitat that they live within. Um, the tidal salt marsh community is a, considered a sensitive community by the state, so it is protected in its own right. Um, wetlands and waters that are within there are also protected. And then you have the Endangered Species Act, the State Endangered Species Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Essential Fish Habitat protections. And then, of course, we also have the California Environmental Quality Act, which provides additional protections to species that have been designated as species of special concern, birds of conservation concern, California fully protected species, and a number of others. So I just wanted to point that out that we have all of these regulations in place um, to protect these species. Um, these mostly don't affect the rowers, but, but to, to just something to be aware of that um, that we are working hard to, to try to conserve these animals. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly talk on rare plants. I'm not a botanist. <laughs> so I'm not gonna get into too much detail, <laughs> but we do have a couple of unique species here in the Petaluma River. Um, these, are, um, these are all, uh, I believe these are all federal listed plants. Um, Sonoma Sunshine on the left, um, upper left corner. Soft bird's beak, and I'm, I'm not going to do the Latin names for you guys. If you have questions, I can send them to you. Um, that's a species that's that's very rare and occurs only in the Petaluma marsh. Pitkin marsh lily and the Petaluma popcorn flower, which is all our all ours. That's a Petaluma unique species. Um, fish essential fish habitat is. Uh, was a term I mentioned earlier. It's the um, it's it's the Petaluma River is designated as a hatchery and essential habitat necessary to the health of our salmon fisheries and also to another of, of other um, fish that we you know are part of our food chain or our food sources, our fisheries industries. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about those fish because I'm not I'm not a fisheries biologist, but. Um, a couple of key species that we have here in the Petaluma River are the Central Coast Steelhead and Chinook Salmon. Um, Chinook Salmon, uh, less so we, we, you know, we have, as I'm sure many people know, disappearing habitat for these species, disappearing spawning habitat because of pumping activities upstream and barriers uh, that prevent these animals or these fish from getting to their natal spawning streams. Neither one spawns in the Petaluma River, but it is important dispersal habitat. It's an important foraging habitat for juveniles um, after they have um, hatched and come down the main stem on their way out to the ocean. So these are andromonous, anim, uh, andromonous species. Um, that means they they move back and forth between the ocean and these and these coastal streams. Um, other species you may see, um, well, long fin smelt you'll never see because it's so tiny, but it's uh, a state listed species um, that's also very, very rare um, and does, um, it does smolt, it does uh, spawn in the Petaluma River and has been documented um, in recent years by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, other species you may see are uh, sturgeon, striper, sunfish. Um, again, usually only if they're jumping out of the water or somebody's fishing them, but 
Sometimes we'll see them on the shoreline. Um, sh leopard shark, which is a small shark. I assure you, no big sharks in this river. Bat eagle rays I've seen um, when I've been out on the water. Um, Sacramento split tail is another special status one. And then there's uh, various other non-native species as well. Lots of um, mammals, considering this is an aquatic habitat, we have both aquatic and terrestrial mammals on the Petaluma River. Um, the big, the big keynote species, as I like to call them, is the salt marsh harvest mouse up there in the upper left-hand corner. The salt marsh harvest mouse only lives in salt marsh habitats of the Bay Area, so it's it's a very um, special protected species. It's federally endangered. It's also fully protected by California state law, um, and it lives in that pickleweed. It lives in the transitional marsh zone primarily but it can move into those other gradients, those other um, zones, I, I call them. Um, and it will, it, will, it will do so at, at during high tides. It's, been, it's a unique species. It's been found to kind of occupy different parts of the marsh um, in its periods of life and, and regionally as well. So it can live in the, if you have cattails or tulies, you have that bull rush, that those are the, the tall weeds you see around. The freshwater systems up near Schollenberger, it can live up in the thatch line there, um, as well as the pickleweed habitat, and, and it can even get into uplands just like a regular mouse. And, and it's out there along with deer mice. So if you see one in the marsh, it's probably salt marsh harvest mouse, but but it could also be just a deer mouse. Um, and then there's uh, just since the river's been dredged, we've been starting to see some river otters coming out to fish, which is really exciting. Um, we also have uh, bats species, I'm not going to identify that one, but um, bats that live under the bridges and in the barns and, and um, buildings that surround the river. Um, red fox, not native, but um, prolific. <laughs> and you might see a red fox foraging along the shoreline now and then. I've seen one in the 10 years that I've been rowing, but it was really an exciting day. Mule deer, um, they are non-discriminate. You'll see them in uplands. You'll see them in salt marsh. Uh, this is the long-tailed weasel. You might see him. I've seen them out by the marina. Muskrat, which I've, I've heard people complain, oh my gosh, there's rats in the river. There's no rats in the river. There's muskrats in the river. And yes, they are related, but they're very, very different species. Um, more closely related to the beaver than an actual roof rat. Um, and then harbor seals. I know Maggie keeps seeing them. I, I still haven't seen one, but I keep looking. But I see them elsewhere, and I have seen them on the river before. Uh, they do come in during those high tides um, chasing fish. Hey, Dana? Yes, sir. Uh, the mule deer? Yes. I think that might be black-tailed deer. I have never seen a mule deer, and I hunt deer. <laughs> um, but I hey, guess it's um, possible. Uh, the chronologically in the Bay Area, mule deer are present and they're common. Um, and I believe that the black-tailed deer and the mule deer are very, very closely related. So in my reports, we've always reported them as mule deer, but but it's it, in this part of the world, they're essentially the same species. Yeah, the black-tailed deer are much smaller. Uh, I don't have much white in them, just a little bit on the tail. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. I, I don't know. Yeah, just to note. I've, I've always been told they're one and the same, but I, I believe they are different, so. Um, well, I can look it up. Yeah, no, I, that's, a good, that's a good point, and I appreciate the input, because I'm not a hunter, and I'm, I'm an ecologist, so I, I'll make a note of that. Thank you. Um, you know, I know the black-tailed deer occur along the marshes in the Bay Area as well, so that's a good point. Um, waterfowl. So I, I listed dabbling diving ducks here because uh, I want to, but they're all waterfowl. Uh, dabbling ducks are those ducks that basically forage in shallow waters. And you, you'll know them when you see them because they're the ones that tip. They tip into the water and their little tails come up. And you can see just their little tails wagging there above the surface. Those are dabbling ducks. Diving ducks then are the ones that disappear and then pop up right when you're on the river. So. Dabbling ducks are more likely to be found in more shallow waters or in the marsh itself, uh, whereas uh, diving ducks are more likely to be in the main stem of the river or deeper waters. But 
for sure you'll see both on the river um, they're inter intermixed and then um uh i've actually got so up here in the left hand corner we've got those are greater scops um, we have greater and lesser scops on the river both um, on the river and as well as the, in the ponds in Schollenberger and the treatment ponds. Um, in the middle upper, that's those are um, northern shovelers. They look a lot like mallards, but they're actually the shovelers, which you can tell by the bill. That's a dabbling duck. Um, on the right is moorhen. Moorhen is actually not considered waterfowl. It's actually considered a rail, um, but I left it, I kept it in here because it, it's both a dabbler and a dive diving. It's not really a duck. It's a, it's a it's a moorhen. So it, it's misclassified in this slide, but there it's a dabbler and a diver that you may see. You may also see it's it's near cousin, which is the American coot. Looks just like it, but has a white bill. Bottom right, that's the double crested cormorant, which is a diving bird. Clark's grebe. We also have western grebes. Those are diving birds. In the middle, one of my very favorites, the ruddy duck, which is a stiff-tailed duck and one of the only stiff-tailed ducks in this um, region of California. And on the left, we have the hooded merganser on the left, left, and then the bufflehead. And anybody that's been out on the river lately, um, we've been seeing big flocks of buffleheads. Um, so that's um, that's a, a beautiful bird to catch a sighting of. Um, and then uh, these birds, so feed on plants, seeds, tubers, herbaceous foliage, seagrass, pond weeds, as well as animals, tiny crustaceans, fish eggs, insects, larger inverts such as clams or even small fish. Food preferences shift with the season and the water. Um, weeding and shorebirds, I put them together. Um, weeding birds are our herons and our egrets. We have a variety, you'll often see almost daily the great blue herons down on the main stem of the river foraging, that's in the bottom left-hand corner. Cattle egret up in Schildenberger Park. We also have Grady egret, which is a larger, similar looking bird. Um, and the green heron down here in the bottom right. Uh, in the middle, we have a, a, just a couple of shorebirds. There's so many that come in. Um, and the shorebirds, they, um, they don't always nest here, um, but they do come into the Petaluma River and to the wetlands during the winter to to roost, to, to loaf about, to forage, and uh, to rest and relax. It's their vacation, it's their vacation home. Um, so up here on the top left or to the right of the regret is the least sand piper. Um, also sometimes referred to as a heap. That's the little guy on the side. You'll see him on the edges of the, of the river and then also in the mud flats. Um, lesser yellow legs. We also have greater yellow legs, very, very similar looking. Um, the same thing in the mud flats, but you may also see these guys foraging about in the marsh as well. Black neck stilts on the left, avocets on the right. Those are uh, also common, commonly seen um, in the, typically in the mud flats. Um, bottom row here with the redheads, that's also avocets. That's in your breeding plumage. This is non-breeding plumage. Um, Wilson snipe, if we have any Girl Scouts on the call. Yes, snipes are real. I was always told snipes weren't real, but they are real. This is taken in my backyard. This is a, another um, shorebird uh, that forages frequently in the mud flats, but can also be in wetlands and in, and in a ponded backyard. <laughs> Go figure. Um, shorebirds. Uh, what was I going to say? Uh, short, the shorebirds, um, like I said, don't always nest here uh, on this part of the river. When they do, they tend to nest in small bear scrapes, just right on the edge of the mud flat. They don't always um, line their nests. Sometimes they do, but um, we always uh, caution our, our surveyors when they're looking for nests that this is the one that you won't see it until you step on it. So we always have to be pretty careful when we're looking for it. Time. Rails and songbirds. So um, as I mentioned, the moorhen, that's that's actually a rail. It's more closely related to these guys. So here's where we have a couple of, of really um, sensitive birds. Uh, the black rail in the upper left-hand corner there is state listed. It's a state threatened species. And then the upper right-hand corner is the Ridge Boys rail, formerly known as the Clapper rail. 
which is a federal federal threatened species. And these do occur. Um, we have been um, documenting black rail um, up in Almond Marsh, as well as in Schollenberger, just south of Schollenberger, and also um, in the marsh um, areas close to the marina um, by the Sheridan. So if you're growing in those areas and, and you are near sunrise, which a lot of us are, you might hear the call of the black rail. And I, I didn't think until just this moment that I could have played a little clip of that, but um, so you'll have to Google it. Uh, Cornell Bird University has great audio calls of these birds if you wanna hear one. So um, in the middle is the Sora. That's also a species that occurs in these same areas um, alongside these other two birds. Um, it's got a call that sounds like it's laughing at you. So if you think you're, <laughs> You're on the river and you hear somebody laughing at you, it's probably just the Sora. Um, and then Ridgeway's rail also has a very distinct call. Um, these birds are all very secretive, very, very hard to see, if not impossible to see. So um, we identify them by going out and listening for their calls. Um, songbirds, down at the bottom, we've got just a couple of uh, special status species. These are species of birds of species, birds of conservation concern. The salt marsh common yellow throat on the left um, occurs, it's relative, the common yellow throat occurs throughout the Bay Area, typically more in riparian habitat, but this, this subspecies occurs just in the salt marsh. Um, and then uh, that's, um, that's a, but actually that's a Brian speller, both Brian's and Belding's um, savanna sparrows so are subspecies of the savanna sparrow again only occurring in salt marsh habitat. So, hawks and eagles, everybody's favorite. We have quite a few. Um, these are not all of them, but there are several more. I couldn't get them all on one slide. One of the rarest that you might see on the Petaluma River is the Swainson's hawk, which is a state threatened species. I've seen one once, and I saw it while I was on a row with the Masters Eat. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Ned was coaching, and I was uh, completely distracted by the Swainson's hawk that you never see on the river, and there it was, and of course I was being told to put my eyes forward, and I couldn't because I couldn't get over the fact that there was a Swainson's hawk on the river. So that that is in the upper left-hand corner. That's um, an unusual bird. It's only here in a uh, spring, and um, it's, we're kind of just outside of the range for the species. It's more common in Napa and the county and the Central Valley moving um, eastward, but you may see it now and then. Um, and it's really distinctive by the collar around its neck. It's always got this dark kind of scarf around its neck, the ruler collar around its neck. Um, all of the hawks in the area, with the exception of this white-tailed kite, have um, what's called um, plumage polymorphism, which means that their colors can vary a lot. So you might see a dark species that doesn't, or, you know, it's all dark underneath or it's all white underneath. That's not necessarily telling of what the species is because there is so much variation. Um, they also have sexual dimorphism. So the females are always larger than the males. Um, so you may see the same hawk and think, oh, that's the baby and it might just be the male. In the middle here is the, um, is the Northern Harrier. That's also a species of special concern. And you'll see Northern Harriers a lot that are always fly, flying really low over the marsh, unless they're, unless they're breeding and then they may go up pretty high. Um, they always have that characteristic white rump. That's that white band around the tail. That, that's your telltale sign that you're looking at a Northern Harrier. Um, golden Eagle, we have Golden Eagles. They, I, they don't nest on the river, they nest up in the hills, but I've seen, we've seen them come down and forage along the river, along the marsh. Um, bottom left-hand corner, that's a Cooper's Hawk. Um, close relative is the Sharpshin Hawk. Those are both common on the river, but they tend to be more associated with um, either urban areas or trees and not, not necessarily with the marsh, but, but, but they will feed on the birds that are migrating through. And then white tailed kite, that's the one that you'll see often. I've seen them in my neighborhood. I don't live, I live pretty close to the marina. Um, they are, that's the, that's the species. A lot, a lot of folks, I'm sure you all probably know the white tailed kite. That's the one that kind of looks like a kite, a little kite that kites when it, it's hunting. It'll sit in place and flap its wings. It's called kiting. Uh, 
one. So that's a favorite. Ness, um, all of the hawks here are um, monogamous and uh, they tend to reuse their nests when they're, when they're nesting. Um, northern, most of, these, most of these species are tree nesters with the exception of northern hairy and white-tailed kite. White-tailed kite will often nest in a, in a tall bush. Northern harrier tends to actually nest right down in the marsh where it's got a lot of grass and cover to protect it. I am not aware of any nest sites in the Petaluma, on the Petaluma River, I'm sure they're there probably in Almond Marsh would be the most likely location for those. Um, that's it for species. I wanted to um, talk a little bit about approaching and viewing wildlife. That's a question that I get a lot. Um, how, how, how can we go out and see these species? Um, and one of the first things I'll tell you is that if you're dressed in bright colors, as we often do on the river so that we can be seen, it will usually will be seen by the animals that we're looking for and they're gonna run away the minute they see us because we're gonna be bright colors and scare them all away. So if your goal is to see wildlife, I recommend that you maybe tone it down or um, bring us something that you can cover up with. I don't, I don't know, but it's, uh, it's a funny thing, but uh, one of the things um, we recommend is that you is maybe keeping noise to a minimum during the nesting season. If you're, if, and, you know, just if you're traveling close to the marsh and, and it's nesting season, um, it's, a, it's a good time to just kind of tone down the conversation you might be having with the rower next to you. <laughs> um, it's important that we try to maintain not, we don't want to startle anything. We don't want to just speed burrow right into a flock of birds. Um, you know, maybe try to approach the birds, either try not to cut them off from one another try to go around them or at least just approach a little slower than you normally would um, as you tear up the river in your fast boat. Um, don't touch the wildlife, it's, it's not a petting zoo. Um, avoid lingering if a predator is in the area. If you see a northern, if you see a little small flock of small birds and peeps along the shoreline and you see a northern harrier coming up the way, it's a good time to, to leave because you can attract the predators to the location that you're at. I only say that because I've, I've had that experience um, where I've had um, come in, startled the birds, um, ducklings especially, if you see ducklings or the small, um, the cygnets, any of that, the small uh, um, newly hatched birds. Sometimes if, they're feel, if they feel threatened, they'll die and they'll drown. So it's a really unfortunate thing. I've never heard of it happening on the river um, knowingly, but it's something to be aware of. If you see hatchlings, don't approach them, just let them go by, admire them, but, but maybe don't pursue them, um, just so you don't have that happen. Uh, what else? Headlamps, same thing. So it's just, uh, considering the timing, considering the tides, if you're in high tide, you're, and you're looking for wildlife, you might not see them, because at high tide, you know, they're moving inland, they're moving away from the water. But at low tide, that's a great time to, to see a lot of these uh, wildlife um, and birds. Uh, same thing at high tide, animals are a little bit higher risk for predation. So you want to be aware, kind of, if you're look, you know, if you're just rowing on the river, this is not a concern for you. But if you're actively engaging with the wildlife and you're looking for them and wanting to view them, um, then then these these things are, are recommendations that I would say taken into consideration. Um, and then, you know, of course, some of these species are very sensitive to human disturbance. Those abacets, I've had them attack me when they have their young. So, so you know, if you've never been attacked by a bird, <laughs> I, I don't recommend it. Um, and I guess I have time for making a difference. Uh, you know, the Petaluma River, it's a, like I said, it's a really unique habitat. It's a really unique place with a lot of really unique, rare, endangered and threatened for, um, species. So the more you know, the more that you can avoid impacting those animals. Um, remembering that storm, all of the storm drains here in Petaluma drain to the Petaluma River. So whatever you let go into that storm drain is ultimately gonna get into the river. So one of the things that I have um, been active about educating folks on is 
surfactants. Surfactants are soaps, basically, your soaps that you use to wash your car, wash your boats. Those surfactants, when they get into the river, um, can actually um, create a, um, a bit, basically change the, um, the consistency around like fish eggs. It'll smother the fish eggs um, and, and keep them from being able to break apart when they want to hatch. Um, it can also change the um, the temperature of the water, which it can in, uh, quote this increase the level of toxicity of any toxins in the water. So, <laughs> of course, we have we have toxins. Inevitably, we have toxins that are in the river that come in through the storm and that come off of the agricultural fields. And so, when we let loose those surfactants into the water, it can increase the level of toxicity of those toxins in the water. That's it's an unusual thing. So, you know, using things that are um, low surfactant boat washes, we've changed the boat, the, the um, detergents that we use at our boat yard at the North Bay Rowing Club for a lower surfactant type of soap. Um, trying to keep that out of the river, not washing as much on the docks down below. Also, um, but just also thinking about when you wash your car at home, where that water is going to go. Um, cleaning your boat between uses. When you go from one river to another river, say you take your boat out and you take it down and you want to row on the, I don't know, <laughs> Lake Sonoma maybe, and then you bring it to the Paddle River, make sure you really wash it well before you bring it back because you can transport small, really small animals that you may not see, um, as well as uh, invasive plant seeds, then, then can get into our river system and spread. Um, a couple of other things that I don't think anybody in this group probably needs to be lectured on, but um, don't remove plants. People are, oh, I love that plant. I want to propagate it. I want to put it in my yard. Don't, it, it's better just not to do that. <laughs> um, rock stacking. Rock stacking. We don't have too many rocks on the Petaluma River, but upstream we do. Rocks, rocks in the river have unique life underneath them that are um, basically those little things that all these birds and, and fish feed on. So um, as we move them around and stack rock carns all over the place, um, we're moving that, that wildlife and, and we're taking it away from those really rare and endangered species. So I always try to remind people, don't, don't do that, don't rock stack. Rock throwing, um, diving birds. I've actually seen folks, kids throwing rocks and then the diving bird pops up and gets hit in the head with a rock. It's a horrible thing, but it does happen. So we don't throw rocks. <laughs> Just these little things. Don't feed the wildlife. If you're going to feed the wildlife, give it something nutrient dense, not bread. Bread is terrible for birds. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Um, but, you know, just the more you know, the more you share with others. Um, oh, and lastly, cut the straps. If you've got a mask and you're throwing it away, cut that strap, please, because it will get into the, however it gets out of the landfill and into the river, it always ends up in the river and then entangles wildlife. So cut the straps, cut the straps around your six pack. Cut the, always cut your straps, and that's it. That, that was not intended to be a lecture, so I just a couple of pointers. Cool. Okay. Well, do you... those are the coots here at the end. American coot. So if anybody, yeah, if anybody has any questions, if I went too fast on or clarifications, like on the species ID, I appreciate that more. I have a, a question that um, came up during the dredging, and I was just curious what the impact is, positive, negative, in terms of the ecosystem um, from the dredging. I know it's probably a question that a lot of people ask, but. There is a, um, <clears throat> a, a negative impact at the time of the dredging. When the dredging is happening, there is an impact. Mm -hmm. um, but they, all of the measures that the Corps takes to prevent any impacts, um, they, there is a long laundry list of things that they do to, to try to minimize that. So the timing, um, <laughs> that's based on work windows to avoid fish, critical, those, those protected fish when they're traveling in the river, mm -hmm. um, which is predominantly winter and spring. Um, they're also avoiding the nesting season. They're working outside of the nesting season when those sensitive species are nesting. Um, we do a lot of surveys beforehand to make sure that uh, those sensitive species are not in the area that the dredging is going to be occurring. 
um, and then the, the methodology that they use that uh, mm -hmm. has a lot of precautions to, to exclude wildlife. Um, but, but overall, it is beneficial because, as you know, the, the river was getting pretty shallow, <laughs> which means warmer temperatures. And warmer temperatures are not good for um, a lot of these fish. They need low, they need cold temperatures um, because uh, the higher, as the temperature rises, so does the, the oxygen levels drop. Mm -hmm. And as the oxygen levels drop, you know, that, that has its own deleterious effects. So um, overall, I think it's good. Um, we are, and like I said, we're seeing a lot of the species returning to the river that mm -hmm. we didn't, you know, we weren't seeing for a while as it got shallow. So mm -hmm. buffleheads are back, the sandpipers are back, the river otters are back. We might, the harbor seals are back. We might even see some bat rays. So. Yeah. Hey, so Dana, do you want to just un, um, unshare? Oh yeah. And then people can see each other. Thanks, cool. Hey Dana, I was gonna suggest, um, I don't know if anybody's been down to the, uh, it's, it's not that new anymore, but the, the sewage treatment plant, it, it's kind of near the end of um, <clears throat> South McDowell. It's right at Cypress Drive branches off there, but Schoenberger has a trail that connects through the marsh to that um, sewage treatment plant. And they have a wonderful, dis, you know, display boards of different birds and a bunch of different habitats there. So if you want to see a lot of these birds, that's a good place to go. Yeah. Yeah, they have a lot of the hawk species, too, because they have that line of trees on the south side of the property. And they've right. got, and that's where I've seen golden eagle is actually down by those treatment ponds. So, I've yeah. had Cooper's hawks, um, juveniles. Uh, in the trees behind my house off because I live on Adobe Creek and uh, you can hear them up in the trees all the time but they kind of roost they've been roosting up there for a while I guess there was a nest um, but they finally matured out and, and left but um, it was pretty fun watching them hang around fly around in the backyard chasing other birds off and what have you. Yeah I was just on a property the other day up just behind up in the hills here in Petaluma, and uh, just just right in front of us, we saw a sharpshin chase another. We it was so fast I couldn't even ID the bird. <laughs> I barely got the sharpshin ID down, and I was right in front of us. Whoosh! Took that bird up. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> yeah, you see a lot of them hovering over the marsh uh, uh, when I walk the Schoenberger Trail there. Dana, this is my well. I've got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, Great talk, thank you very much. Uh, wanted to know your thoughts on the Dutra plant that's kind of still lingering there uh, in future. Oh, I don't know if I want to touch that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I can tell you what little I know is that there's no salt marsh over there, so um, that's good. You know, I, 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 I can't really speculate um, as a lot of their operations have been going on for, for decades. Um, as to, I think a lot of the opposition has been more towards the air quality, um, as well as concerns about discharges, you know, but the board, the state board regulates those. And so I trust their judgment on the ultimate decisions to allow that go to a board or not. I don't, I don't see a great deal of threat because the, the marsh is not over there. So, but like, as far as a direct threat, other than those two things, I don't, yeah. I don't necessarily I don't think that there's a real threat there. Okay. And I was kind of surprised in your talk to not see any uh, Canadian geese. <laughs> <at their, laughs> I don't like them. <laughs> during uh, uh, nesting season. <laughs> so. You bring up a good point, And I was waiting for somebody to bring up the point that I didn't talk about the swans. <laughs> yeah. Wants to, right? So those, so those birds are, um, well, you know, Canadian geese. So, so they're native, they're endemic. Um, the, the mute swans are not, those are mute swans. They're not tundra swans um, that we've been seeing on the river and they've been prolifically repopulating. Um, I will say the good news is that, um, so those birds, they're, they're problematic because they um, reproduce very quickly and, and they, reproduce a lot of species at a time, you know, you get 10, 10 of them out there. Um, and then they take, they kind of take over, they take over the nesting areas, they take over the foraging areas. Um, 
the dredging, one of the benefits of the dredging is all of the spoils that um, they put into the Schildenberg Park. You know, that, that park was designed as a dredge spoil site initially, and that was what created it. Those ponds get too deep, and then they don't drain down, so you don't get the mud flats and that you need for these birds. And then you've got mute swans. I think I went out there last year, and there were like 12 mute pairs of mute swans, and I went, oh my god, you know, trampling all of the eggs that are anybody that is trying to nest out there. So, um, you know, getting those dredge spoils in and, and getting more shallow waters again in that area is really beneficial. So I see, I think there's, I, I've been watching, I've been, we've been walking, we walk out at Schellenberg at least once a week and um, looking out there to see things changing. And, and so I think they're, we're starting to see some positive benefits of that. Some of the um, workers there told me that that affluent that came out of the riverbed is settling and then they're going to use that sand they're going to harvest it and actually use it in construction once it's uh, cleaned all the garbage out of it and stuff but uh, pretty interesting that they're continuing to use it yeah isn't that cool yeah it's a uh, it, and again it's that you know looking at that system and how we interact with it um it's really important, you know, and, and how we go in and reusing those soils and is beneficial. Um, but then also the, the whole interactions between every, everybody that's in that, in that area, in that pond, everybody being every, every animal. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, <laughs> I guess I'll admit now that I'm pretty guilty of um, anthropomorphism, <laughs> which doesn't necessarily go in line with my being a biologist, but, um, but I can't help it. <laughs> Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Dana, uh, this is Ned. Hi, now, Ned. Hi. So first of all, I have my deep apologies to you for upsetting your... <laughs> Swainson's hawk, you mean? Your time for the Swainson's hawk. <laughs> I did. I don't remember at all. But I believe you. Um, I scored. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah. So two things. One, uh, I got here a little late because I was working. I had some issue. But anyway, our friend, the peregrine falcon, who roosted out on the five. Any comments you want to make about that? There's a peregrine falcon that roosts out on the five. I think I need to start rowing further. <laughs> <laughs> it hangs out right on that little, uh, you know, steel ring, uh, ring platform up there. That, that's it. It's, it's a spot. It keeps an eye on the marsh, you know. Oh, that's cool. I don't think I, I, I guess I haven't been out to the five in a long while. I, I might have to push myself to get out there. Um, <laughs> it's a long Well, then way just about me. peregrine falcons in general. Yeah. So, per yeah, I, you know, I, and I actually made a mental note as I was going through my um, uh, presentation that I forgot to mention falcons. And there are, we have a couple of falcons. We have the peregrine falcon and we also have prairie falcons. Um, prairie falcons do use salt marsh. It is a prairie to them. So you may see them out. Prairie falcons are a little bit smaller than the peregrine. And they, they, eat, they eat fish and birds. So they're, they're carnivorous. <laughs> I think they're actually omnivores. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, I, Peregrine falcons do, they nest though, they don't nest on the marsh. They tend to nest up in, um, up in the hills. They like uh, cliffs, uh -huh. cliff dwelling. Uh -huh. So uh, that pair, it'd be interesting to see uh, where that pair is nesting. And it, it's possible that it's not nesting anywhere near the marsh. It, it just forages there. Uh -huh. um, that's, in, I'll have to look, I'll have to look. Okay. I know that there's some that nest up in the Palisades. There is a nest on the five. Huge nest. Yeah. A huge oh, nest. It's on the, it's on, on, the, the, on, the, on platform, the platform, on the. Oh, well that, that's probably where they're nesting then. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like. It was someone it's, else's nest earlier then. Yeah. But yeah, they'll steal, they'll steal nests. And yeah, they can't, I've seen them on, I see them on power poles. You know, they used to nest out on the power towers down in Contra Costa. Mm -hmm. Every year they'd be there um, on the power plant on the, uh, I forget what those are called. And here's one other regional question that I'll shut up, Dana. Ecological question. Um, 
we're looking to increase our ability to sequester carbon in our area. And a, the simplest way to do it is to create healthier soils in the working land. So compost application is the simplest reason for that. As the, hell, as the soils get spongier and more able to absorb water, they also retain sediment. So there's not so much sediment being eroded off the landscape into the river. Um, how would that affect nesting and all of that sort of thing? If, if our sediment flow is reduced? Oh, well, um, that's a good question. Well, so for nesting, you know, the birds are nesting in the marsh. They're nesting along, you know, in, in either in the salt marsh or in the uplands uh, surrounding the marsh in the transitional zones in the upland, the high marsh, and then, and then the actual uplands and seasonal wetland. I mean, it depends on the animal. Um, so the sediment there, yeah, that's, that's more long-term subsidence versus short-term. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of that is replenished by sediment in San Pablo Bay that's coming out of the San Joaquin Valley. Right. Deposited there. I mean, a lot of the, yeah, a lot of the sediment now is being, you know, like I said, dredge spoils are where we, where we deposit our dredge spoils. So we always have dredge spoils. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we seem to have a never ending supply of dredge spoils because they're out there dredging the bay all the time too. Oh, right, right. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I know. I think, you know, it's a it's a dynamic system and the, the Petaluma River, especially because it's tidal. So you've got these natural riverine processes occurring from upstream and then you've got the tidal happening as well. Um, I'm not sure that I could really speak to that in terms of I think that overall we're you know, anything we're doing to address climate change is important because, you know, as the waters rise, <clears throat> these transitional zones are going to change. <clears throat> Pardon me. You're going to lose, you know, you're going to lose some of your um, transitional zone. Your transitional zone becomes emergent and your high marsh becomes transitional. And if then you have urban, where's your high marsh, your high marsh is gone, you know, or your that transition to the urban is gone and you lose your buffer. It's going to be really interesting to see as, as we keep moving into this uncertain territory, what we're going to start seeing in the landscape, what sort of changes we're going to start seeing there. I don't know. I can only speculate. I'm afraid. <laughs> but I, I, I'm glad to hear that, that you're working on that. Ed. Hey, Dana. Yes. Um, I was going to, First of all, I want to thank you for the uh, the talk and the presentation. The pictures are marvelous. Um, I want to ask you, I don't recall you saying anything about the swallows. There oh, are, I skipped the swallows too. Right. Oh. There's a lot of swallows out there. I was just wondering. Um, and they, they come and go. I think they're seasonal, aren't they? Yes. And, and they have a unique, I'm so glad you brought them up because I did. I, I completely omitted them. They're, um, which is dumb because they're all over the river. Um, <laughs> I apologize. They okay. are under, yeah, they're all over under the 101 bridge. You see them over on the Dutra side, over along the wall there. They also nest under the, um, that, that, um, viewing pier that's mm -hmm. right there on Schollenberger. They nest on the other side of that. Yeah, we've got lots of swallows. Um, mostly they're rough wing, rough rings, rough wing, wing, I'm really good at rough winged swallow. <laughs> And then um, also the cliff swallows um, are the ones that nest there up on okay. the other side of those bridges. Well, there's so um, many, there's swallows. so many species. It's hard to get them all in one presentation, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, no, the, I'm, the I'm red winged blackbirds. Sorry. Those red winged blackbirds are prolific yep, in the reeds. They're prolific, they're prolific too. Yeah. Oh, and they'll make such a racket. If you're if you're listening for for black rails, you know, out there by the marsh in the evening, you might just yeah. hear them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they have a unique call because they're multi-tonal. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting. I don't know if you, it, I kind of tune in because I'm, I'm a, you know, an RF engineer. So multi-tone multi stuff is kind of <laughs> what I do. And when I listen to those things, I go, how the heck can they possibly make so many different frequencies at the same time? It's, it's amazing. Yeah, no, that's, that's very, that's a great point. 
I, and I wanted to say one of the things about the swallows is they, they have a very they have a different nesting window than everybody else. Almost everybody else starts nesting in March. Mm -hmm. um, the swallow uh, the swallows don't get going until about May. Oh really? And so what that means is that their window actually extends into the fall. They often are still nesting as late as September when everybody else is done. Um, probably because of the cooler temperatures along the river, they're able to extend that way, but. Dana, is that when we see them just going nuts off of that? Is is that when they're just flying? I mean, every time you go out, they're just, it feels like you're being, you know, like there's bats or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah especially in late spring, you'll, May, boom, you'll start seeing them like going crazy because they'll be building those nests. And they, like, they basically go into the mud, they scoop it up and they slap it on the side of the 101. I have a question. Um, we and often- they'll read as well we when we go out early in the morning we see what ned likes to call the commuter birds the white i think they're egrets snowy they, egrets snowy yeah. egrets yeah so i guess they're coming from by dempsey's and i used to i it seems like i see so many more birds now um since the dredging but it's like i notice them coming at me when i'm going towards the sunrise but then I don't know where they go. And I feel like some of them are going to right by um, by the marina, but there's at least like 10. And then I'm like, wait, where'd they go? Where do they go in the morning when they take off? That's a good question. They probably go, they probably go to forage. So they may be going down. It depends on the, again, it depends on the tide. So they may be going down to forage along the main stem. They may be going inland to, we see them, I see them a lot at Schellenberger in the, in the freshwater marsh there. Mm -hmm. uh, they come in there too. And, and egrets are fun because oh, egrets and herons both will eat fish, but they'll also eat birds and lizards and whatever they can get. What, whatever they can get. Mice. <laughs> Salt and harvest mouse. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think they're probably going to forage. And, and you know, I, I, I think I skipped over that too, the rookeries. There's, you know, the, we've been watching the rookeries change over the last 10 years. I mean, we used to have the Dempsey's rookery and I think they're actually still, they're, they're still at the Dempsey's or they have been in, they were gone for a while and then and then they were back is what I was told that they're, <laughs> the pandemic and they came back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's nobody here now. Uh, they were in that tree down by Basin Street, the Basin Street properties and then that tree fell in the river. They were, then there was a tree over where Caltrans came in and took it down for the highway and that was, a shame that was that was heartbreaking um i don't i think there's another tree at schellenberger or the treatment ponds or one of the two they're they're roosting there now i don't know i have i've lost track of them but i know they're they're finding their way to they'll they'll eventually find the right place for themselves it's the mostly the regrets so, so i have a quick question about seeing tracks you know, so what look like actual otter tracks on the dock, but how do I tell the difference between that and the weasel tracks if in fact there are weasels? <laughs> and maybe, you know, anyway. Otters are big. <laughs> they're like, they're, they're, they're big. They're like the size of the biggest dog, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, like, wow. If they look small in the water, but they're actually quite large. Size is always, I always warn people don't, don't judge them by their size because you never, that's not as much, that's helpful. But, but you know, river otters are, are bigger. I can, I can look up some tracks for you. Well, I, I can too. I, I can Google it, but I figured. Big track look right here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so good at tracks. There's a guy in, um, there's a guy out of Point Reyes uh, that does track, track classes. And they're, I think they're really inexpensive. I don't know if he's still doing them. I'll check it out. He can do all the different movements so that you can. It's pretty fun. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Hi, well, Dana. Thank you for the presentation. This is Tom, even though it says Chris on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious about the river otters. I mean, when we've gone hiking, typically in the in the mountain areas, you see them in very clear, pristine mountain streams, and it's pretty easy for them to forage. I'm just curious how they manage to do that in a silt laden river that you can't you stick your hand in the water you can't even it disappears about a, you know six inches in and how they manage to find food and with that kind of visibility that's a good question 
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, um, I don't think the Petaluma River is their preferred habitat, personally. Unless, and I think that when they're here, they're really kind of looking for those streams. They're trying to get the, the tributaries. They're going up into the mm -hmm. tributaries when they're wet. And I think that's why we don't really see them a whole lot here. But but they are here, and I've I've seen them in the bay, you know, along the marshes along the bay when they when the same thing. They're getting into those sort of sort of freshwater um, systems as they come out in the bottom of those systems where they can get up. Well, we see an awful lot of uh, muddy footprints on the dock that seem to indicate they, you know, they like to come up and they'll they'll walk up the ramp. Where have I been? I, I guess I'm not rowing enough because I'm used to now. I gotta get there early in the morning. <laughs> well, you don't see them, but you see the evidence that, that somebody evidence. was walking through there. So. Yeah. No, I. It's um. It's exciting to me because we haven't been seeing them. We haven't seen them for so long with the river getting shut. We haven't seen them at all. And then, you know, before that, we used, I used to see them on the road. You know, crossing the street <laughs> to get. Down at Lakeville, though, you can see them out there on the crossing the street to get down into the water. Like, what are they doing here? But, you know, again, they're chasing the food. They're going up into those little tributaries yeah. and, and foraging there. Cool. Cool. I have one more question. If <laughs> Yeah, no. If there's any studies or what have you that are going on right now on the Petaluma River that we should kind of keep an eye out for, um, or, you know? That's a good question. Um, you know, Point Blue is always doing stuff. Um, I'm not sure what, I know that the Spartina study, the big study right now that's happening in the Bell Over River is the Spartina study. And, and that they're doing a lot of um, surveys, bird surveys associated with that. They're looking at the, the correlation between some of these rare birds and the Spartina. And I'm not, I don't know a lot about Spartina, but you can look up, you can Google the Spartina study. And um, Olaf, Olafson Environmental is heading up that effort. Uh, they've been doing surveys all over the Bay Area as part of that larger Spartina study. And then um, we're doing, yeah, we're, we're doing surveys right now for the, for the city of Petaluma um, because they're still planning to dredge the marina. So we've been doing studies out there as well. Well, it sounds like dredging is good for the river on a whole bunch of aspects. Yeah, I think frequent dredging isn't. But <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully that, a little more often than every 20 years. Yes, I agree. It's a, <laughs> it, is, it is what it is. And now we have to maintain it because we have all these interactions with it that prevent it from being very natural. So we have to maintain, you know, start, finish what we started. Cool. What's well, about 608, 609? Um, any final last questions or comments that people have? For Dana? Yeah, feel free to, you guys all have my emails. So you can email me too. <laughs> <laughs> Just a big thank you. Wonderful. Yes. I'm glad it was informative. Very appreciative. Yeah. <laughs>